Praise God. Thank you so much for praying for me and Joan. I'm, I'm, that's why I'm wearing this black suit today. No, I'm not in mourning. Don't get, this, don't get this twisted. But years ago, there used to be an advert where a guy dressed like this to deliver chocolates to you. Do you remember? And he would, he would jump out of an aeroplane, scale a mountain, a tall building, swim through shark-infested rivers just because the lady loves milk tray. Do you remember that? How many of you remember that? Lift your hand. Man, you people are old, you know. That's a lot. You people are old. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Well, I think I was more like that in the younger part of my marriage, and I would do that. But now I go, if you want sweeties, you drive yourself to Tesco's. That's where I'm, I'm, I'm too tired, man. Actually, Joan Williams, I would still scale a mountain for you. I would still swim a river. I really would. She's been a phenomenal wife for 36 years. I'm looking forward to the next 36. I love her. So thank you, church, for praying for us, for all of those that are enjoying anniversary or birthday moments today. Well, thank you for praying for Pastor Ants. That's my brother from another mother. And um, he, very rarely, as Chris said, is unwell. And so when that happens, we pray for him. I mean, his family have been through a time of it recently, but we pray that he will have a speedy recovery. Amen? Okay, turn to the people next to you, either left or right, and say, the day's message is called, Stand Up and Fight. That's what the message is called. Stand up and fight. Chris, you got my water there, brother. I just felt it's time for the church to stand up and fight. We have so many things pressing against us. And I think, it's, you know, the opportunity can be that church gets depressed. You go into a shell. You just, you know, roll over and die and play dead. And I'm thinking, we shouldn't be like that. We've got too much in the scriptures, too much at stake to be people who back down, backslide, back off and back out. We can't do that. So today is a day to fight. And I don't know what you came into the service carrying or having had to work through or deal with. But today is a day where you're going to shout the victory over your problem. Amen. 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 Come on, I'm preaching far better than you're listening right now. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's what we need to do. So I'm going to, if you've got your Bible with you, go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And you really ought to read verses 1 to 54 when you get home. But I'm going to read verses 1 to 11 for this message today. Stand up and fight. It says, The Philistines had now mustered their army for battle and camped between Socho in Judah and Azekar at Ephes Damim. Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. Then Goliath... A Philistine champion from Gath came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine foot tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and as thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. And Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. And I, the Philistine champion, I am the Philistine champion. But you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him... You will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that we would never be deeply shaken by the taunts of our enemy. I pray that there will be such a courage in the heart of your people today that they will not be intimidated and humiliated by this voice that shouts. Give us the courage to understand that these battles can be won in the name of Jesus. Are there any believers in the house today? 
I mean, real believers in the house today. Amen. Because this is where we're going. Well, this is a great story. And it's so well known. We've told our kids these stories in Sunday school and, and all kinds of children's ministry for years and years and years. Because the story of David and Goliath is such, a, is such an amazing one. I remember quoting it when Dave Goodison came to our church. Where's Dave? Is he here today? Can't see him. I should be able to see him because of how tall he is. But Dave came in and Dave Goodison came in. I, I never met him before. And he came to our church and I looked up at him and I said, hey, good morning, sir. He goes, hi. I said, what's your name? He said, my name's David. I said, I thought David was the little guy. <laughs> we tell our stories and we have fun with all of those things. But I think there's real deep meaning to it. And today I want you to be encouraged as we share. Are you ready? Christians have never been promised a trouble-free life. And yet we feel entitled to one. And when pressures and difficulties come, we're like, so why did this happen to me? When we face difficult seasons, we seem to you know, want to throw in the towel. We want to roll over and play dead. We even question if God has left us or why do we deserve to be treated like this? Look, Scripture's full of warnings and exhortations about the issue of conflict and pressure in your life. In Psalm 138 verse 7, it says, <clears throat> Though I am surrounded by troubles, you will protect me from the anger of my enemies. You reach out your hand, and the power of your right hand saves me. That's one of the songs from the Old Testament, and that's what the psalmist said. In Isaiah 43 verse 2, God says, When you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. In Naaman 1 verse 7, it says, The Lord is good. A strong refuge when trouble comes. He is close to those who trust in him. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8 to 9, the Apostle Paul says, We are pressed on every side by troubles. We are pressed on every side with troubles. But we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. I love that faith. I love that heart. So the biblical writers anticipate that hard times are inevitable for all of us. Whether you're an Old Testament writer or New Testament writer, they seem to all say difficulties come. In fact, one Old Testament writer said this, a man is born for trouble as the sparks fly upward. All you need to do to get a bad day is to be born. That's it. Just show up on the planet and you'll get some trouble. It's just one of those things. Life isn't what we'd always like it to be. But let me tell you something. Even though we have inevitable pressures, they're not unbeatable. Luke chapter 10 verse 19, Jesus says, Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. How many of you believe that Jesus tells the truth? I do. I believe that he does tell the truth. And he told his disciples, listen, there will be challenges. There will be some scorpions and some snakes and some ugly things that can happen to you. But don't worry. I've given you enough power to deal with the stuff that seeks to pressure you. Oh, hallelujah, man. So that's why I wanted to pull open this story today and go, come on, church. I think it's time that we just get a little bit more warfare inside our hearts. They get a little bit, you know, riled up a little bit and go, hey, you know, why am, I, why am I taking this stuff? There's pressures all around my family. The stuff's getting inside my head and in my heart and in my mind. And it's just clear, clouding my faith. Sometimes I wake up and I feel I'm so burdened down. I don't even feel like going to church. I don't even feel like praying or reading my Bible. Anybody ever had experiences like that? I know you have. And so, but we're in here today and I don't want that to be perpetuated. I don't want that to continue. I want people to get up and go, come on, man. It's time to kick that stuff out. It's time to deal with that stuff, and it's time to stand up and fight. So we've got this story where the children of Israel are camped on one side of the hill. There's a valley in between another hill. There's this Philistine champion. He's screaming at them for 40 days. It's an amazing standoff. And he keeps saying, all we need is just one person. All I need is just one person to get this breakthrough. Come on, who have you got? You mean after all of this time, all, all of these champions, you don't have anyone who's going to come down to me? Even King Saul is terrified. And, and from the biblical records, Saul is a tall guy. He's head and shoulders taller than anybody else in Israel. 
Real iconic figure. If you see him out in front of the army, in fact, his introduction to us, King Saul's introduction in the Bible, is when he helps Israel win a war. But he himself is intimidated. And it says the whole of Israel was terrified as this giant steps out. Let's talk about this giant as he steps out. It's interesting for me that um, there's a little bit of a backdrop. I need to tell you a little bit of a backdrop to the story about Goliath. And and you might find it a little bit of an interesting history. Because it reflects on Joshua's campaign when he led the children of Israel across the Jordan and into the promised land. They went on a campaign, military campaign, to capture land. God had promised them territories and said, whatever the kings are, whatever the authorities are that are there, you just push in. And I'll, give you, and I'll give you victory. We saw that in a place called Ai. We saw that in Jericho. They marched around. The walls come down. They have tremendous victory. As a matter of fact, it says that the kings in that region heard about Israel's military campaigns. And they were so successful that those kings, it says their hearts melted. They were so nervous about Israel, what Israel was doing. They were having incredible success. And it's fantastic. And one of the things that Joshua did was to deal with a group of people called the Anakim. There's some history to these people, but they were incredibly tall. They were like giants. And in that region that Israel was supposed to possess, they were living there. And, they, and he fought against them. Some of those people ran out of the region and they went and hid in other territories. But he dealt with them. And, and then it says he defeated them. So I want to read you this scripture in Joshua chapter 11 because it's going to be pertinent for what we say today. It says, during this period, Joshua destroyed all the descendants of Anak who lived in the hill country of Hebron, the Beer and Anab and the entire hill country of Judah and Israel. He killed them all and completely destroyed their towns. None of the descendants of Anak were left in the land of Israel, though some still remained in Gaza and Gath and Ashdod. Remember these names. Some of those giants that he should have killed were living in Gaza and Gath and Ashdod. So, Joshua took control of the entire land just as the Lord had instructed Moses. He gave it to the people of Israel as their special position, dividing the land among the tribes. And this is the last phrase. So the land finally had rest from war. Joshua got to a point where he said, we're done. No more fighting. We have rest from war. And I looked at that phrase and I went, may God help me never to do that. May God help Emmanuel Christian Community Center uh, what am I talking about? <laughs> Emmanuel Community Church International. I'm so confused. I'm seeing Pastor Andrew here. The old names, the old names are coming back in my head right now. Hey! Champion. Amen, 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 amen. Some people remember that. Lord, I love you and I worship you. You are worthy to be praised. Everybody sing. Lord, I love you. And I worship you. You are worthy to be praised. Lord, I love you. And I worship you. You are worthy to be praised for you are worthy 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 to be praised that was one of Pastor Andrew's most favorite songs singing it we bless you sir bless you buddy Well, because I'm seeing him there, I'm getting all confused about the names I'm speaking. But it's Emmanuel Community Church International. We should never get that spirit that says we're resting from war. Because there's still territory to be taken. In fact, Joshua did incredibly well. You know what the record says. But some territories were still not defeated. In fact, if I read through into chapter 13, I just read you a passage from chapter 11 in Joshua. But in Joshua 13, it says, when Joshua was an old man, the Lord said to him, you are growing old. And much land remains to be conquered. This is the territory that remains. All the regions of the Philistines and the Gershurites and the large territory of the Canaanites extending from the stream of Sihor and the border of Egypt northwards to the boundary of Ekron. It includes the territory of five Philistine rulers of Gaza and Ashdod and Ashkelon and Gath and Ekron, the land of the Arvites. 
That's what God said to him. Joshua, I know that you're getting on in years now, but there's still some stuff that's not been dealt with. There's some territories that have not been conquered. Now, let me tell you something, friends. Those neglected territories were going to prove to be a problem in Israel's future. See, the, the unresolved issues that you have in your life can do the same for you. If there's an unresolved thing that I've not really conquered, I've not really nailed it, it will turn around and try to nail me. And so there's now time for us to go, hey, no time for rest from war. I need to deal with this thing. Now, let me give you an example of those cities. Samson, who was a judge in Israel, was seduced by a prostitute in a place called Gaza. Gaza was one of the territories that Joshua didn't deal with. The Ark of the Covenant was at one time stolen from Israel. And they took it to a Philistine city and it was taken to a place called Ashdod. That was the city that Joshua didn't defeat. And then we've got in this story a giant called Goliath who comes out of a place called Gath. Gath is one of the territories that Joshua didn't defeat. Oh, I wish Joshua had gone in and said, let me deal with these areas, man. I wish he hadn't taken a rest from war and just thought, that's not going to be a problem. We've done enough. This is what people do. I've done enough. I don't want to fight. I don't want the tension of this. I just want an easy life. And God said, Joshua, you've left it a bit late, mate. There's some stuff that needs to have been dealt with and it wasn't dealt with. And later on in the story of Israel's development, we see that those very places became a problem. We're looking at Goliath's history and background. He came from Gath, a territory that should have been dealt with. We should never have heard of Goliath. But he was able to emerge because somebody just didn't finish the job. Hello. Hello. Somebody didn't finish a job and deal with somebody that should have been killed a long time ago. Well, let's look at the profile of this giant. We're told he's over nine foot tall. He's got a breastplate weighing 200 pounds. He's got a spear that's like a beaver's wing. It's eight foot long. The head of it weighs at least 15 pounds. Some translators say it could be up to 25. It's a massive thing. With his armor barrier and his shield and his leg guards. He has been a warrior from his youth. With huge experience. And he's a nationally proclaimed and acknowledged champion and warrior. He stands there screaming at the armies of God for over 40 days. And his strategy is really to ridicule them. Look at me, I'm a champion. Who have you got? You're just the slaves of Saul. There's not one among you that's got any spine, any backbone that's ready to start a fight with me. None of you are willing to step up. You just step back. You're all weaklings. You're yellow belly and you're soft spine. And you can do nothing against me. Bullies love to speak like that. They love to intimidate. They love to ridicule. They love to make sure that people feel fear driven. And then you're so paralyzed by your own fear. You don't do anything. But we can be like that, can't we? When our pressures start screaming in our faces, you feel paralyzed. What do I do now? I feel paralyzed. And somehow, Goliaths are still chatting to people today. There's still some Goliaths looking across the hill in your direction, saying, you can't do anything about me. But today, this Sunday, come on, everybody, this Sunday, tell your neighbor, this Sunday, Sunday. it's going to change. So you're going to name your Goliath. I want you to do that while you're sitting there. I don't know what your Goliath is. What's your Goliath, Dave, Tracy, Chris, Jackie? What's your Goliath? Name your Goliath. Because see, people are facing all kinds of Goliaths, whether it's rejection. The pressure of that in some people's history has taken away their confidence and their sense of value. Maybe it's negative thinking. They just can't. They always see the glass as half empty rather than half full. Maybe it's to do with fear and anxiety. Some turmoil in the mind that just, they can't make decisions. They're just indecisive about everything. Maybe there's an impurity issue that's just filled their mind with all kinds of ugliness and uncleanness. Maybe it's an addiction, some life-controlling substance that they can't talk about. I still know Christians who have to sleep out of a service and smoke a cigarette or or, or a joint or drink alcohol to the point that their mind is blurry because they can't sleep at night. There's still people who will come to church and love Jesus. They genuinely do love Jesus, but there's just an area. There's just a territory that's not been dealt with. Like I told you, if you don't nail it, it's coming to nail you. So today, let's nail it. Let's nail it. They had fears, confusion. Maybe it's guilt. Maybe it's shame. 
Maybe it's just an indisciplined in life. You just can't organize and manage your life to the point it's just in complete disarray. And everywhere you go, you think, I just can't get my life together. That's my giant indiscipline. Well, let me tell you something. In this story, that problem, giant, gets dealt with. And for David, his problem becomes his promotion. I love that. You look at it and saying, this thing is, is, is licking me, man. This thing is shouting at me. It's screaming at me. I'm intimidated. I feel pressured by it. But this could be your stepping stone to success. This isn't the time to step back. This is the time to step up. This is the time to step up, Ollie, and make sure that you fulfill every purpose of God for your life. Hallelujah. I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, sir. You need to step into your destiny. Shake off any idea that you're not good enough, that you're not big enough, that you're not clever enough, that you're not quick enough, that you're not skillful enough. Because God said, everything you need for the purposes I've designed for you is already inside your life. You're going to be prosperous and fruitful in the things that he's called you to do. We're calling greatness out of this young man. Amen. We're calling greatness out of you, Ollie. It's time to step up. Don't step back. Step up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because challenges make us dependent on God. And dependence on God is a good thing, people. Challenges will make you dependent on God. Listen, challenges will disrupt the apathy and complacency in your life. It's a good thing to do. Say hi for me. (laughs) Complacency and apathy need to be dealt with. And sometimes it's only a challenge. It's only when your back is against the wall. You go, I've got nowhere else to go but to come out fighting. Then suddenly we see a new side to you. We see a new appetite in you. We see a new a desire and aspiration. Hallelujah. Challenge forces us to grow bigger. When a team were trying to get up Everest, they tried a couple of attempts and they failed. Whether it was the route they took or, or the weather conditions that trapped them. But they were giving a, 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 a presentation, a report to the media and there was a big picture on the back of one of the, uh, the stages that they were on of Everest. And one of the members of the team, as he finished his presentation, turned to look at that, ma- that picture of Everest and said this. We will do it. We will make it up there. And I'll tell you why. Everest, you can't get any bigger, but we can. You can't get any bigger, but we can. Challenges make you grow bigger. Today is a growth day. Challenge proves the authenticity of your faith. One of the New Testament writers says this. Faith without works is dead. You say you have faith? Show me your faith by your works. He said, I want to see a faith that gets demonstrated. I don't want you to be living with just a theory, some kind of academic idea about faith and belief in Jesus. Yeah, we've just made mental assent to what the preachers say in our church. We agree with it. No, he said, I want to see that demonstrated in your life. I want to see you lift that shield of faith, that assurance that God is with you, because that shield of faith can quench every fiery dart of the enemy. He didn't say that fiery darts aren't coming. He said they can be quenched because of the faith that you have in your heart. Lift Up your faith, because that proves the the authenticity of where you're walking in God. And I believe that challenge is the breakfast of champions. Champions are champions because they don't just win occasionally. They win, and they win again, and they win the next time, and they win the next time, and they keep on winning. That's what makes a champion. I want this church to be full of champions of faith who won't quit, who won't back down, who won't be silenced, who won't run away in fear just because life gets tough and it's going to get tougher and more difficult to be a Christian in our day, a Bible-believing Christian. But Jesus said, I give you power to stand on snakes and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy and nothing's going to injure you and I'll never leave you or forsake you. Hallelujah, man. I don't know whether you're getting blessed or I'm getting blessed. I'm going to keep preaching, man. I'm I'm blessing myself right here. (laughs) Amen. So we hear this story, and, 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 and David steps out as the champion for Israel. They didn't expect this guy. Look at his history. I told you the history of where um, Goliath came from. But David, David comes from obscurity to prominence. Nobody really knows about this young guy. He's in his late teens. But he comes from obscurity to prominence. He comes from a place 
of rejection to a place of recognition. They forgot about him. You know, when God said, I'm going to anoint somebody else to take leadership for the nation, he sent the prophet Samuel down to a guy's house, a guy called Jesse. And when he went into Jesse's house and took a meal, uh, and they, they were going to have a celebration there, people must have wondered why they come. Every time a prophet like that shows up, people get nervous. They got nervous. The elders came out. Is everything okay? Is everything's fine? He gets to Jesse's house. And he says, Jesse, the Lord's told me to see your sons. He goes, okay. So he brings out all the sons that he thinks the prophet needs to see. And they're big, strapped in guys. You know, some of these guys joined Saul's army. They're strong, hench looking guys. And then the prophet goes, yeah, I've seen them all, but I'm still a bit bugged. He said, well, what's the problem? These are, these are great sons. He said, yeah, I get it. You know, as looking on the outward appearance, we probably would have chosen one of these. But that's not how God works. Je- Jesse, you, you have any more kids? Do you have any more sons? He goes, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, how do you forget your son? <laughs> well, I say that, but I mean, I did once. I've got to be honest. I was at church in South London. And you know, pastors are always shaking people's hand on the way out of the building. How are you doing? Oh, good to see you. Praise God. You're always pressing the flesh and trying to connect with people. Don't see some of them in the week. It's just nice to catch up. And, and so by the time you get to the door, you're normally the last one out of the building. So I got to the door on that Sunday. My son's running around. Joan's in the building chatting to people. And I thought, I'm at the door. I never get to the door this quick. So I'm going to go up to the house, put the kettle on. When Joan comes in, it'll be a nice cup of tea. So I did. Got home. It was quiet. I put the kettle on. Enjoyed the birds singing, sat in the chair. <laughs> I love you, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so then the door opens, click, click, click. Joan walks in. I go, hi. And she goes, uh, so you're home? I said, yeah, yeah, I got home early. We a cup of tea. She said, no, no, no. Where's Leon? I said, well, no, he, he was with you. She, he said, no, no, no. I left him with you. I said, oh, we've lost our child. She said, mm-mm, mm-mm. we haven't. You have lost our child. <laughs> Believe me, I've, I've, I've had to face Goliath a couple of times. <laughs> you have left a child. And, revelation, you are going to go get him. So I went down to the church. Now, my son was fine. Everybody in the church was looking after him, giving him biscuits and ice cream. He couldn't care less whether he had parents or not. <laughs> he was quite happy to be without parents and orphaned because these people take care of you. And then I walk along and people go, oh, pastor, how did you leave your soul, pastor? <laughs> How could you do that? They're trying to make me feel so bad. I was like, oh, my days. So I guess you can probably forget your son by accident. But, but Jesse, where, where is your son? Are you in the morning? He goes, yeah. We've got a little guy. He's just out, you know, doing the errors, looking after the sheep and the goat. He said, well, we've got this celebration meal coming. That's why I came here. Um, but we're not going to eat until he comes. So go and call your son. So they called his son. And this is what it says. Samuel said, these are all your sons? They're still the youngest, Jesse replied. He's out in the field watching the sheep. So he said, send for him at once. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. John Williams, have you ever met anybody who's dark and handsome (laughs) with beautiful eyes? Just, Just check him. So he says, this is the guy. This is the one I've been waiting to anoint. This is the one the Lord's going to use. So bring him in. How do you know, David, that you're going to be the one? The prophet saw you. Nobody else saw that in you. It takes spiritual eyes to see someone's potential sometimes. Everybody else goes, ah, you're just doing your chores. You're just a back voice. You're just out in the backwoods. We don't need to really consult you. We don't need to bring you in. He was going from rejection to recognition. But that's fantastic. Because this chapter reveals a lot about David's profile. It tells that David, in those hidden years, when he was in obscurity and nobody really saw him, you know, he developed incredible musical skills. Somebody once said, you know, David, this guy, uh, son of Jesse, he's a, he's a really gifted musician. He's a talented guy. He's got some ability. Oh, okay. He's obviously applied himself to learning if he's going to be that skillful in his instrument. He developed survival skills, told stories about the way he killed lions and bears. Man alive as a young man. He grew encouraged in with those things. He was a student of wisdom. We know he loved the scriptures and had memorized them. A word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. We knew that David was full of wisdom and insight for the, because of those things. But there was something more about David, and people recognized it. And they said, the presence of God is with him. And this is David in obscurity. Not many people know him. He's not got a big profile. He's not got a big name. He doesn't carry a business card. They said, but the presence of God 
is with him. Let me just say this to you in this room this morning. God doesn't require you to be well-known and highly profiled before his anointing can rest on your life. While well, nobody knows about you, ain't nobody calling your name, and nobody's calling for you and thinking that you're special or that you're anointed or gifted. They don't know anything about you. In your quiet, obscure years, learn well. Develop your skills. Build your courage. Because David didn't become a champion when he faced Goliath. Facing Goliath just showed what a good champion he already was. Because he'd been doing that in obscurity. He'd been singing praises to God up on those hilltops. When he saw a lion jump into the sheepfold and grab one for dinner. He said, well, hold it, hold it, hold it, Leo. Hold it. Hold it. Put the sheep down. He said, I saw a bear. And this is what he said. He said, I ran after the bear. Run after a bear, Chris. He said, I grabbed it by its beard and smote him. Put it down, Mr. Bear. Too quick, Yogi. (laughs) Come on. If I saw a bear or a lion stealing one of our sheep, I'm like, help yourself to the chops. (laughs) You, You want mint sauce with that? You know, come on, bro. David grabs his sucker and punched him in the face. My days. What was he learning in quiet? What happens to a teenager who loves God? What happens to a teenage worshiper who honors God when no one's looking? What kind of uncanny courage do they develop? What anointing can rest on them? They recognize that on David. Powerful. And his strategy was incredible. It was incredible. So David becomes well known and because of those things he's taken into Saul's household. They they bring him into Saul's household because Saul is going through a, a depressed moment. It's very, it's demonically inspired. There's something occult about it. And when this spiritual issue happened to him, he just was so distressed and unsettled. They said, we need somebody to play for him. And David played. And as he played, Saul used to get some respite and refreshing. He said, I want David to stay with me. He told his father, let David come stay here. So he became a court musician because the favor of God upon him. He became Saul's armor bearer. And got military experience and developed the courage he had to kill a bear or a lion. He was now watching as he walked out in front of King Saul on on battle days. He was the armor bearer. Fantastic. He'd be walking through the courts. We'd go, that's David. That young guy, he's he's working with the king. Wonderful privilege. Wonderful opportunity. But there was one more thing about David. I listed a number of things about his skill. But the thing I didn't tell you about David was his humility. In spite of having all the opportunity in the favor of God and learning those skills, there was something about this guy, and champions need to have this, is the spirit of humility. Because, you know, with all of those gifts and skills and talents and abilities, you can get a big head. You know what I mean? You walk into the room and the church is singing, how great thou art, and you think the song's about you. (laughs) Hello. No, David... Was humble. Listen to what it says in 1 Samuel 17. Jesse's three oldest sons, Eliab, Abinadab, Shemir, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. And David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army. But David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. What's David doing? David is not forgetting where he came from. Whatever opportunity God's given me, whatever platform he's put me on, whatever I've developed and accrued in terms of gift, skill, and capacity, I must remember where I came from. There was a sense of humility about this guy that's going to help him in his life. Believe me, because he would make some mistakes, but it was his humility and his willingness to repent that kept him going. What a wonderful thing. Now, his strategy, because I'm going to finish quickly. I've got a few more points. Let me just bulletproof this, uh, bulletproof, bullet point this, and move on. David had a strategy against the giant. This is where we're going to be right now. David considered, firstly, the reward. I'm going to go and fight this giant because there is purpose and benefit to doing so. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he's allowed to defy the armies of the living God? That's what David said in 1 Samuel 17. Secondly, David resisted all negativity. While he's standing there, listen, when David's brother, oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing 
around here anyway, he asked. What about these few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and your deceit. You just want to see the battle. What are you doing up here, David? You just want to smooch around and have a look at some blood sport today. You're supposed to be looking after those little chores back home. What are you doing here anyway? And David said, what have I done this time? What have I done now? You know, when somebody says that, that's because they've had that thing said to them a number of times. You've been saying that to me all my life. Pushing me to the back of the crew. Pushing me out of the room. Sending me on my chores. Nobody's given me the respect and the worth that I really deserve and should have been given. So what's what's my problem now? What did I do wrong this time? But David was willing to push through that negativity even when people misunderstood him or didn't want him to succeed. David remembered past victories. I told you about that when he told Saul. I've killed lions. The Lord rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear. And he will rescue me from this Philistine. He says, this is all in chapter 17. David refused to be an echo when he had his own voice. Don't compete. Never compare. Be yourself. Be who God made you to be. Don't hide behind somebody else's armor. He said, look, if you're going to go out and fight this giant, I get it. Try my armor. And David tries it. He's just walking around like this. I can't use this. I've never fought in it. I don't understand it. I can't hide behind somebody else's armor. Nobody can fight this battle for me or give me a leg up to win. I've got to stand on my own two feet and make this work. That's what David said. Hallelujah. So then David prepared himself for war. He picked up five smooth stones from the stream, put them in his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Praise God. Get ready for war. And then David knew the fight was more than physical. This is what David said. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies, plural, of the living God? See, Goliath had no covenant relationship. The mark of circumcision in a Jewish man's body said, that's a covenant sign. You're in relationship with God. And David said, this guy hasn't got the same relationship with God that I have. He hasn't got the same resources that I've got access to. He hasn't got God on his side the way I've got God on my side. And listen, we've got more than one army. If this army is nervous, God's got another army. You know the story, don't you, in, uh, in 2 Kings 6, where a prophet's servant went out one day and there was an army coming to get the prophet Elisha. And the servant got so nervous. But Elisha said, don't be afraid. Uh, those who are with us are far more than those who are against us. And Elijah, Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Whatever physical army God has, he has a supernatural army that you can't see yet. They're surrounding Elisha. I mean, they came for one guy. How many times, man, if only your eyes had been open, you'd see them all around your house. Huh? You'd see them all around your house, man. You wouldn't be worrying and crying and go, please, God, I'm finished. He'd open your eyes and you'd see horsemen, chariots, resources, supernatural resources, more than you could count around your house and around your circumstance. Well, David knew that this was more than spiritual, uh, physical. There was a supernatural army. And he knew that the Philistine did not have the same covenant connection that he did. He knew it was supernatural. Because, you know, we need to understand this, friends. Because in this story, some of you missed this point. But Goliath called on demonic powers to assist him in the fight. Maybe that's why he kept winning. There was some occult power with this guy. And it says in 1 Samuel 17 verse 43, he said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Hello. See, because we don't understand the issue of these things or what that really means. When he cursed David by his God, he's invoking some supernatural evil against David. David had to realize that sometimes, you know, the problem, and you and I need to, sometimes the problems we face, some, some of it can be dealt with through counseling and support from others. Thank God, get all that you need. But if there's a demonic entity involved, demons have to be dealt with the way demons have to be dealt with. There's no other way out. There's got to be a fight and it's supernatural. But thank God the weapons of our warfare are not of human invention. They're not carnal. They are mighty through God. 
They pull down strongholds. They destroy arguments. They undermine every plan of the enemy. Whatever wild scheme or any kind of ugly agenda he has purposed against the people of God to derail them and to defeat them is going to be destroyed. Mighty through God are our weapons. Hallelujah. And David knew that that was the case. And therefore, he was able to verbally declare his faith conviction. Oh, I want to hear people do this. Even in the quietness of their own prayer closet, they declare it. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. And I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that this is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give all of you into our hands. Man, that's the voice of a champion saying, my conviction of heart is being articulated through my mouth. Out of the abundance of your heart, you have to say something. You have to say something, man. When I'm feeling like I can hardly move in my bed with COVID-19, I look in this mirror. My skin looked weird. My eyes were weird. I sound like a madman to some people when I put my hand on the glass and said, COVID-19. If you're living in my body, then you can die in my body. In the name of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. I'm here today because people prayed that way for me. People in this room prayed that way for me. We're going to articulate this and say, you're dead. You're finished. Your purposes are not going to continue. We thwart that. We defy you in the name of Jesus. Speak it out. Say it in your room. I'm getting mealy mouthed and nervous about this. And people think, oh, they're going to think I'm silly by doing this. Let me tell you something. When you're in a real crisis, you find the craziest prayers to pray for you. You do. Sometimes we, you know, we try to be all smart and comfortable and you know, tidy at church. But when you're in a crisis, you find those crazy people who scream and pray in tongues and run around the building. Pray for me. Put your hand on my head right now. Because I know that they are not intimidated. They don't care. And we need a little bit more of that in our hearts and in our church. Amen? Amen. He ran to meet the giant. The Philistine moved closer to attack David. says, David ran quickly toward the battle line. I love that line. He ran quickly, reaching into his bag. He grabbed the stone, threw it, and it struck the Philistine on the head. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. They must have heard a crack when that guy's skull broke. Boom. He goes down. And David ran. Oh, my time is coming down. I can't finish. Christian, Bill, oh, church, whatever. Hang with me on this. I've got to finish this message. But here's the story. He falls face down on the ground. And there's a shout. Everybody gets excited. But a temporary victory is not enough. A moment of respite and truce where the devil backs away and comes back later. It's not enough for some of the things that he has set up against us. We have to finish this. Once and for all. David did not just wound the giant. He killed him. You've got to take the head off your Goliath. That Goliath you just mentioned to yourself a few minutes ago, you've got to take its head off. Don't leave that little piece of territory to grow another attack against you. Make sure this time you take complete control of it. You're going to nail it undeniably. Its day is done in your life. Wrong relationship, cut it off. Wrong investments, change them. Wrong mindsets, say, look, God, wash my mind, help me to think differently. Wrong habits and addictions, it's time to get a breakthrough. Whatever it takes, medical or miracle, get the breakthrough. So that you can become that kind of, take the head off this sucker, man. We need to. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and and drew it from the sheaf. And after he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that that their hero was dead, they turned and they ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines. I love that line too. See, this is how I want to fight my battles. Stand up and fight. And you need to do that because once you do that and you prevail... There's a lot of other people who were too nervous to do it in their own corner. 
And they see you and hear your testimony. They go, do you know what? If God can do it for Chris Palmer, he can do it for me. Those other Israelites saw what David did and it says that they jumped up and shouted. Jesus. I want to hear that shout in church. When testimonies are given, that we go, it's time to. It's not just one person to get a breakthrough. Everybody up in here needs to get the breakthrough. Hallelujah. And that's what David did. That was his strategy. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Listen, man, did you name your Goliath? Stand on your feet, church. Come on. Stand on your feet. For just a few minutes, we're going we're gonna to go to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to go for war. If you have a, a Goliath that you're fighting, I want you to come and stand in the front. Don't be frightened. You're going to come take it to the battle. Take this battle to the front right now. You're lonely. We're going we're gonna to break this. There's people saying, I want to get married. I don't know why I can't get married. I don't know why I can't get relationship. People saying, listen, I need to get out of my marriage. The devil is messing up my family. Some people say, I'm sick. I don't know why my body won't be able to do what it's supposed to do. The doctors are giving me all kinds of things. So church, while you're standing there, stretch your hand towards these people who are here praying today. And I want you to lift up your voice and begin to pray for them. This is the time when the whole of the armies were there. They were all watching David, man. As he stepped forward, they were all watching. And so we're watching today as these individuals step forward. Some of you in the prayer team come down the line. We're going to begin praying for people. Lift your voice today, church. I don't need a quiet church. I need people who are praying. Who knows what heads are going to fall off the devil right here? What plans the enemy's had that is going to be decapitated because we're praying this morning? What assignments from hell are going to fall to the ground fruitless and void of power because of what we're praying in this room? Come on! Hallelujah! Elders, you better come over here. I need the elders in this church to be praying for people. I need you if you're a small group leader and any of your folks are here, you better come find them. You better come find them. Come on, come on. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're rising up this morning. If you pray in tongues, please pray in tongues as well. We're rising up this morning to break the power of the enemy over the lives of these individuals. Some of them have been intimidated for years with the same things the devil keeps on doing and doing and doing and doing again. Reminding you of their history, their failures, their weaknesses, their vulnerabilities. But today, this is the day the Lord has made. Today is the day we rejoice and we're glad in it. This is the day. Hey! Shabra bakuriyan deke na babrosa. Britunuruki basalabanda. Yes, Father. Glorify your name in this place. Destroy every plan of the enemy. Lift every fear, every burden. Help them understand that they're clothed in the armor of God. And no weapon formed against them shall prosper. But if they seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, glory to God, all that they need will be added to them. This is the day. This is the day. Thank you, Lord.
Hallelujah. Praise the name. Oh, Rika Sabro Kanda. We keep praying. Maybe you said, I, I wish I'd step forward. You still can. Or just raise your hand. We're coming to pray for you right where you are. We're going to make sure that people get delivered today. This is the day of deliverance. This is the day when the giants go down. Come on. Come on in the name of Jesus. There's still people in the queue. I need some more prayer warriors walking around this group here. Walk around and pray. Some of our small group leaders, there's people here in the aisles who need prayer. They're just waiting. Hallelujah. Tracy, can you come and join us? There's groups of people here. Just jump, jump in. Pat, walk through the crowd. Walk through the crowd, Pat. There's people here. Hallelujah. Shit, about a church. Keep praying. If you want to sit down, you can. I know I'm asking you to stand. But if you, you want to sit down, you can. But just, just please keep praying with us. Keep praying with us. Have you been praying with us? Pray Hallelujah. While you're praying, Keisha, come lead us in that song. There's power. There's power. There's power in the name of Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. There is Good morning, my name is Ora and welcome to Community News.
We started a new group called Little Leaves at the Green Leaf Centre every Monday from 10 to 11.30. It's a stay and play, term time only, and there will be a £1 contribution. Friendship Hour is back. It's on every Wednesday at the Green Leaf Centre from 12.45 to 2.30. Even though it's aimed at older people, everyone is welcome for some food and fellowship. On Wednesday the 28th of September, we're going to have our last morning prayer. It's from 7 to 7.30 a.m. on Zoom and the link is on the website. In October, we'll be starting a new series called Living With Less. It will be a small series about tips and tricks for how to save money during the cost of living crisis. We'd love for you to join us. Okay, so this part of the section is called Getting To Know You and today you're going to be getting to know me. So the first fact is that between the ages of three to five, I actually lived in Jamaica. So even though I was born here, my parents went to Jamaica to work for two years and I didn't come back to this country until I was five years old. That was in 1997. My mum says when I came back, I was speaking more Paswa than I was English. Whenever the bus used to come, I'd say, bus I'll come. <laughs> but now I absolutely can't even speak anymore. So yeah, that's one fact about me. The second fact about me is that I'm actually a co-host on a podcast. It's a Christian podcast called Real Talk, Real Walk, where we talk about lots of life events and just general Christianity. And so yeah, check it out when you can, if you can, if you'd like to. The third fact about me is that for a living, even though I have a law degree, I actually work in compliance, in financial services compliance for a bank. So yeah, I'm also married to Eugene and we have a daughter, an 18 month old daughter called Ramaya. So that was the getting to know you part of the section. If you want to get to know me whenever you see me in church, just come and say hi and I can tell you more. So that's all the announcements for this week. If you want to find out more information, you can just check out our website and I'll hopefully see you next week. Bye!